Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 52nd of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, we have a discussion about the class of 2020. You can catch COVID calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also hear COVID calls recorded as podcasts on soundcloud.com. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID calls. Please do help spread the word about COVID calls and send suggestions for guests and future topics. On Wednesday, we'll have the second part of our class of 2020 COVID calls with Olivia Van Buskirk, graduating from Central Michigan University, Apurva Selvaraj, graduating from Drexel University, and Elizabeth Whiteside, a senior at Woodrow Wilson High School in Dallas. As of today, May 26, 2020, there are 5,550,399 confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. That's up from 5,462,447 cases yesterday. 1,672,714 of those are in the United States, up from 1,653,904 yesterday. There are now a total of 98,636 deaths from COVID-19 reported in the United States, up from 97,948 deaths yesterday. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story every day and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is Ruth Rosenstock, 93, was a teacher and volunteer. This appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer, written by Gary Miles, April 25th. Todd Rosenstock didn't need to pore over reviews or listen to old recordings to know which books to read and big bands to sample. He and his mother Ruth exchanged their favorites all the time, so he had a constant source of critical commentary from an obvious expert. And what commentary? A longtime fifth grade teacher, Ruth Rosenstock was a voracious reader who played piano and saxophone as a teenager. She knew all about band leaders Stan Kenton and Hardy Shaw and devoured crime novels. She even sang for customers at Wittich's music store in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, when they considered buying sheet music. So she was not shy about sharing her artistic views with her only child. She knew all the big bands and I shared some rock and roll with her, Todd Rosenstock said. She heard The Grateful Dead and said she probably would have liked more of that. Mrs. Rosenstock, 93, died on Tuesday, April 14th at Rosewood Gardens in Brumall of complications to the coronavirus. She enjoyed volunteering at Reading Hospital and the Historical Society of Berks County. Born in Hazleton, Mrs. Rosenstock worked in the Wyomissing School District near Reading for nearly 30 years in, pub in three different schools. In a tribute, Todd wrote that his mother loved hearing about the impact she had from former students. Ruth's firm, steady hand in the classroom and compassionate attention to her students will also live on in the many student teachers she mentored over the years, Todd wrote. After retirement, she volunteered at Reading Hospital and the Historical Society of Berks County. She lived in an assisted care facility in Collegeville before moving to Broomhall in January. Mrs. Rosenstock was always willing to lend a hand to those in need. Despite her many accomplishments, Mrs. Rosenstock will be remembered by Todd and his wife, Roseanne, mostly for her patient and pleasant personality. She was always willing to lend a hand, Todd wrote, and this served her well, as her many friends were eager to give her their time and kindness as she aged in her retirement. Okay, let's turn to our discussion today and let me introduce our guests. Chris Lehman is the founding principal of the Science Leadership Academy, a progressive science and technology high school in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Science Leadership Academy is an inquiry-driven, project-based, one-to-one laptop school that is considered to be one of the pioneers of the school 2.0 movement nationally and internationally. Chris is the 2014 winner of the McGraw Prize in Education. 2013, he was named Outstanding Leader of the Year by the International Society of Technology in Education. In September of 2011, he was honored by the White House as a champion of change for his work in education reform. He is an accomplished author and public speaker and has written for education publications such as Principal Leadership Magazine and Learning and Leading with Technology Magazine. 
Serenity Barazzini is a class of 2020 student at Science Leadership Academy. She's graduating this spring. She was in the CTE engineering program and was captain of the FRC team 4454. She'll have to tell us what that means. She spent most of her time in robotics, but could also be found playing Magic the Gathering or video games with friends. She is now going to Drexel University as a mechanical engineering major. While she is unsure of what lies on the road ahead, she aspires to be a high school engineering teacher someday, taking inspiration from her own engineering teacher and mentor, John Kamal. And our third guest is a teacher at Science Leadership Academy, John Henkel. John, do you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself as we get started? Sure. Um, I currently teach sophomores biochemistry and seniors, uh, senior sciences at SLA. This is my fifth year teaching overall and my first year at SLA. Great. And where are you from? I'm from Springfield, Pennsylvania, Delaware County. So right next to Broomall, actually. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. And thank you uh, also, Chris and Serenity, for making time to come on COVID calls today. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. I'd like to remind everybody you can get questions in uh, YouTube Live. Just put them in the chat function, or you can put questions up on Twitter. Just be sure to tag me at USO Disaster, or you can um, email the questions directly if you want to to sgk23 at drexel.edu. So, um, I'd like to start the conversation the way we've always been starting, and that's just to find out where people are calling in from and, and how they're doing. So maybe, Chris, I'll start with you. Where are you calling from, and how are things there? Um, well, I'm sitting at my kitchen table right now, which has been my makeshift office here in Philadelphia. Um, so this is the principal's office for Science Leadership Academy, otherwise known as my kitchen. Um, occasionally, the principal's office goes out to the back patio when it's nice out. Uh, and, you know... Um, I'm doing right. I am. I got into this work a long time ago uh, to, you know, do this work and make lives better for kids and, and create educational opportunities for kids, but also because I really like being with them. And uh, this has been tough, right? This is not the year that any of us wanted to have. And this is not the way that, you know, me sitting at my laptop every day is, as the kids will tell you, is not the way I spend my life. So uh, it's been, uh, it's been quite a change. So you're, you're sort of out and about in the hallways kind of principal then? I am very much an out and about in the hallways kind of, kind of principal. Also, my office tends to be one of the unofficial senior lunchrooms. So um, <laughs> uh, for me not to have kids just hanging out hanging around with me all day while I do my work and, and just being present uh, is very strange. So Serenity, what about you? Where are you calling in from and, and how are things going there? Uh, I'm calling in from South Philly. Um, we have been, <laughs> I live with my mom and, and my boyfriend's currently still working, but my mom is out of work. So I've been spending uh, a lot of time with her way more than I'm used to. Um, usually I spend all of my time at school or at work uh, and I'm used to staying after school for really long periods of time. So this is the first time since I started high school really that I've had much time in the house. Um, it has its ups and downs, but uh, I've been trying to keep myself busy and focused on things that I like doing uh, and trying not to bicker too much with the other people living here. Well, that's good advice for anybody in these times, I think. <laughs> keep, the bickering, keep the bickering down. We are all uh, at home a lot more than we're used to. I guess particularly for a high school senior, that's, that's really something. As you said, you hadn't been home that much in a while. Yeah. John, what about you? So I'm calling from uh, Philadelphia at, in my apartment with my dog and my fiance. We actually got engaged in the middle of all of this. So it's been great and crazy at the same time. Um, and Congratulations. I, thank you, thank you. I, I was already and, planning like a separate like weddings uh, COVID call. So we'll have to, <laughs> we'll have to let me know. This. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be there. Yeah. Um, and it's also weird for me. I live astoundingly close to school, um, to SLA. So I actually see it every day. So it, it's pretty crazy to live this close and not be able to go there. So you can see the school from your apartment? Right now, yes. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. 
Well, thank you again all for making time to do this. Chris, let me just turn to you first. Can you tell us a little bit about the vision that inspired SLA and how you got the school open? <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, I had a dream that school could suck less for children. And uh, more importantly, that school could be empowering authentic places um, where people came together to learn powerfully together. And so we started SLA back in 2005. Everything we do is built around our five core values. Uh, inquiry, what are the questions we can ask? Research, how do we find answers to those questions? Collaboration, how do we work together to make those answers deeper, better, richer? Presentation, how do we show what we know? And reflection, how do we step back and learn from what we've done? Uh, and then um, through that, you end up with this very messy, very loud, very authentic, uh, very student-centered form of education. The other thing that we have a big belief in is this notion of the ethic of care. The idea, and you noticed it in the way that John talked about his job, he didn't say, oh, I teach biochem or I teach senior science, that I teach my students, I teach the 10th graders biochemistry, I teach seniors medical science and what have you. And so that notion that um, no subject we teach is more important than the students we teach really is at the heart of everything we do at SLA. So it's an inquiry-driven, project-based, caring approach to education. And, um, you know, we've been at it for 15 years now and what was one school have now turned into three. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the sort of very quick version of it. There's obviously a much longer version of that story. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's, that's what we set out to do. And, and um, that's what we've tried to hold on to. That's always our North Star. And uh, we'll keep doing it in whatever way we can during this time and then really looking forward to doing it the way we really know how once this is all over. Tell us a little bit more about, so it's it's a charter school? I mean, not no, everybody- no, okay. no, no, okay. no, So I'm, I, no, I want to no. put that out there because not everybody's no. sure about no, what you know, no. different schools take different forms in Philadelphia. Uh, so we are uh, a three school network inside the school district of Philadelphia. So we are a network of schools within the school district of Philadelphia. Um, we are public schools. Um, uh, two of our schools are magnet schools where kids apply to get them. Okay. One on our SLA middle right. school is the neighborhood middle school. Uh, between all three schools, we serve every single zip code in Philadelphia. Our kids come from, a, at least, a, for example, from Center City campus. A traditional class, a class of 125 freshmen will traditionally represent between 60 and 80 different um, schools that they went to for middle school. Okay. And how many students overall? Um, at SLA Center City, we have 500. Um, that serves nine to 12. At SLA Bieber Campus, that is good, that serves five through as of next year when it's fully full, we'll serve five through 12. And that'll have 750 students. And SLA Middle School serves five to eight and has 360 students. So roughly speaking, um, about 1,600 kids overall are enrolled in one of the, in the SLA schools. And just one more question about, about you. Um, did you, when you were graduating high school, did you think you were gonna be a high school principal and education leader? Is that something you had in mind from an early age? Well, I mean, we've got such wonderful media images of principals in the world. I think that, you know, everybody aspires to be that guy from the breakfast club who sits with the kids during, you know, Saturday detention. And that's really a vision we all have. Um, you know, I was raised with parents who from a very early age, um, the sort of mantra of our family is the purpose of life is to make the world a little bit better of a place because you happen to live in it for a little while. And I am the son of a union lawyer and a teacher. So public education has always been something that was near and dear to my heart. Um, interestingly, I had to convince my mother who's the teacher that it was okay for me to be a teacher. She had uh, different ideas that I could go do other stuff. Um, but and actually the way that I convinced her of that was um, I went into her class, her sixth grade class in Lawrence Township, New Jersey and taught a sample lesson. And the kids were like, oh my God, there's two of them. And uh, from that moment on, she kind of gave me her blessing for this. So um, it's not that I wanted to necessarily um, be a teacher. I wanted to make a difference. And I lived in DC for a few years, right out of college, tried to make a difference in the world of politics and nonprofits and found that to be eminently frustrating and saw teaching as a sort of grassroots way to really make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to work at a school in New York City that was a young school. I worked with the first class of seniors my first year teaching and I really helped that school to develop. 
And when you have the opportunity to work in service of somebody else's dream, it kind of gives you license to dream your own. And I would say that that school was 80% of what I thought a school should be. And the last 20% was, um, was the loose tooth that couldn't stop wiggling. And so, uh, you know, that was the birth of SLA was, you know, that sort of, if this is what I think school can be, can I do it? And I watched, like I said, I helped two school founders sort of enact their vision. And I was part of an amazing group of educators there who worked really hard in service of that vision. And then wanted the chance to say like, well, my vision's a little different than this. And, and maybe I could, you know, build something that is representative of what I believe school can be and, and can do for kids. Well, Serenity, let me ask you, how did you make the choice to become a student at Science Leadership Academy? What's it like to be a student there? Um, so I first found out about SLA through one of my old babysitters is an alumni, uh, Jesse Collins. And he was babysitting me while he was still a student there. Um, and he, he just talked about how great it was all the time. And as I got older, after he graduated and started his life, uh, the school grew too. And I was homeschooled until sixth grade. And then I went to a mastery charter school. And knew once I was there that I did not want to go there for high school <laughs> and uh, I, I knew that I wanted to be at SLA so that's where I that's where I ended up going and I, uh, I started there as a freshman and it was def it was a lot different from going to a charter school beforehand especially a mastery school uh, just different teaching styles, different kind of community, different relationships between the students and the staff. And it was a really hard transition. And I, I honestly don't think I grew into myself until like my junior year. Uh, but I'm really glad that that's the school I ended up at. And so your interests, it said from, from your biographical statement, have been in technology and in robotics. Is that how far back does that go for you? Uh, when I started as a freshman, uh, there was the activities fair and I couldn't decide between going to the Slam Poetry Club or robotics. Uh, I've been a student and community member at uh, the nonprofit Mighty Writers since I was eight. Mm -hmm. And so going into high cool. school is definitely more on like a artsy side of people. Um, I have a passion for math, although I'm not very good at it. Uh, and so at that point in my life, I knew that I loved science and math, but looking at other students that were older than me and other students that would just get like perfect scores in those classes, I thought that that wasn't for me. And at this activities fair, I was like, you know what? Um, let me just, you know, give it a shot do something different that I'm not used to. And I fell in love. <laughs> uh, all four years, I was on the robotics team and uh, you can usually find me in the engineering room. I definitely uh, learned mostly from being on the team that I could do something that I loved, even if I wasn't very good at it yet uh, without too much um like I wasn't going to lose anything by doing it it's just that kind of place where you can try something new without having to pay the price for it if it doesn't go well and for me it went well and I made sure that that being my experience as an underclassman kind of dipping my toes in the water of engineering and learning things that I hadn't learned at my previous school when I was in leadership positions as an upperclassman I made sure that I was constantly trying to recruit underclassmen and help other students feel that same kind of welcoming uh, thing that I felt in that anybody, regardless of background or interest or what they wanted to go to school for later could be on the robotics team as a functioning member. <laughs> Is that kind of the vibe of the school that the upper class are expected to sort of exert some leadership and recruitment of the younger students coming up? Uh, I don't think 
that it's something that's expected. I just think it's something that kind of naturally happens. Mm. There's a lot of student assistant teachers uh, that help with the underclassmen classes and courses. Uh, I think at least for me, and I know some other people who had like a very rough transition from middle school to high school, seeing the impact of how upperclassmen treated them they, I know just a lot of us wanted to pay it forward and I don't think that's something that's like necessarily like said out loud but it's just kind of what you do. <laughs> it's there. So John you said you had five years of teaching experience previous and then came into SLA. This is your first year at SLA? Yeah so this past year was my fifth. Um, I had four okay. years prior to this at a okay. charter school um, not too far away from here actually. Um, so yeah this was a crazy first year. Absolutely. What's your, tell us a little bit about your pathway to becoming a teacher and then what it's like to be a teacher at SLA in normal times. Although sure. you haven't really had normal times, but let's assume yeah, some normal times. Nothing's been normal. Um, <laughs> so very similar to Chris, my mom is a teacher in the Philadelphia school district. She's taught either first, second or third graders um, for the past, uh, sorry, mom, if you ever hear this, 30 years, I want to say. Um, so I've always known that I've wanted to be a teacher. Uh, when I was in middle school, I wanted to teach art. When I was in high school, I wanted to teach uh, phys ed. And then I had a wonderful, wonderful uh, homeroom teacher and anatomy teacher in high school who really inspired me to teach students biology. So that's what I went to Westchester for. And as I was teaching over the past four years, I always kind of put uh, SLA on a pedestal. I always heard about it as this inquiry-based, project-based, open school that accepts everyone that um, puts kids first. And when, so both Chris and I play Ultimate Frisbee and he's been playing for a long time. I've been playing for a long time. So we've kind of crossed paths in the past. I, I've been playing for a shorter time. He's shaking his head. Um, so I've been playing since I was a sophomore in high school. And uh, we bumped into each other at, while we were both coaching and there was a position open at SLA and he uh, pushed me to interview and here I am. So it was- I, That's uh, not entirely true. Here's the funny part, which is I didn't think we had a chance to steal John away, but we'd gotten a resume from a student teacher at his school. And so I saw John and said, can you tell me about this student teacher? And, uh, you know, and he was like, yeah, you know, they're great, da, da, da. Why? And I was like, well, we have a position. And he said, well, would you consider me for that? And I was like, oh my God, yes. Because uh, I've, I've known, and John has been playing Ultimate for a long time. Um, just, I'm old, so I find that. <laughs> um, I had known, known him for a long time to be just a really fantastic coach and a great person. And I had seen him interact with kids in a way that I was like, oh, this I know this guy can teach. So I didn't even think we had a shot at him. And then when he was like, well, what do you think about me? I was like, yes, absolutely. He came in and just blew the interview committee away. It was awesome. So I've heard of, in, yeah, go ahead. In I, terms I, I of to say, I've heard about golf as a networking space before. I've never heard about an ultimate Frisbee as a networking opportunity before. I'm learning so much already today, but go ahead. Things, I mean, I think all things are networking opportunities. I mean, if you play it right, right? I mean, like, and that is, I mean, the beautiful thing is, is like, you know, I mean, uh, you know, whether it is, you know, whether it's going to be Serenity at Drexel next year, running into first robotics competitors from other schools. I mean, like, wait, I know you, you were on this team or that team, you know, whether it's, you know, ultimate, whether it's whatever. I think one of the things that's really interesting, of course, is, you know, and it's one of the things, I mean, it's fun to hear Serenity talk about, I don't think this is expected, but it's kind of the ethos. And of course, it is the thing that we, it's all very intentional about how you create these experiences for kids and how you create the, the opportunity, not for like, to say to the kids, now go be leaders, but rather you create the conditions by which kids can be without necessarily like, this is leadership class, right? But what's interesting is, you know, when you say like, oh, I've heard of golf as a networking opportunity, but not some of these other spaces, some of that gets to the stuff that we actually actively try to work on at SLA, which is, you know, golf is well known as a networking opportunity because the halls of fat power are filled with old white men who play golf. Yep. And the trick is how do you create other spaces 
where people who don't have to be old and white can actually get to places of networking and places where the networks they form are powerful and authentic and important, right? There is no, for example, like there is no better network if you live in, you know, the cities than the barbershop for, you know, it was one of the great networking places of, you know, in, in, in urban culture, not an old white guy culture, not golf, but certainly if you want to know what's going on in North Philadelphia or in West Philly, you know, yeah. we're back in the day when I lived in Washington Heights or what have you, you went to the barbershop right. and that was just a powerful, just as powerful, but just different um, avenues of power and different avenues of influence. So how do we recognize all of these spaces in the same way that we can recognize that uh, a robotics club can be a powerful leadership opportunity, a powerful networking opportunity, an ultimate Frisbee field or what have you. How do we change the balance of what people recognize as opportunities to network, to lead, to build, to create? John, do you wanna Yeah, and I think SLA, yeah, it's great. The SLA does this fantastic job as Serenity said, to build it intentionally, but also behind the scenes. There's this fundamental foundational idea of respect that you just feel when you walk in the doors or when you're virtually with someone at SLA that the students who leave this school know how to use their network because of the amount of respect and the amount of um, communication and care that we espouse here. So. And there's, of course, plenty of good old fashioned curriculum and teaching that has to go into it as well. So you're in your first year of doing that curriculum design to fit the SLA model. Mm -hmm. What's that been like? Um, it, it was funny. The school that I worked at previously, um, I guess in my second year of teaching there, um, was attempting to adopt a project based model. And a lot of what we did was based on what SLA had already created in terms of core values, in terms of being inquiry dri driven, especially in the science classroom. So I had already had um, SLA light, but it was kind of carved out by me. I had to do my own research. I had to figure out how to do it on my own with some great advisors and mentors along the way. And so I already had a little bit of experience with it, but being surrounded with teachers at SLA that have been doing this forever has been such a cool learning experience. And I'm sure Serenity can talk about all of her teachers that she's had here, just creating this fantastic dynamic uh, curriculum that allows students to really hit their potential and be the best that they can be. Well, let's turn a little bit to this year specifically. Thank you all for um, describing your school as a place that I would like to go back to school and be a student at. Um, Chris, start with you. You had a pretty dramatic year before COVID-19. And yeah. I know people have not been following the story in Philadelphia, but um, you know, Philadelphia is an old city. It has um, old buildings, sometimes with old problems. Uh, although <laughs> I'm not sure SLA's building was that old, but uh, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about some of the challenges through the fall. Yeah, so um, SLA's original building on 22nd and Orange Street was a leased facility and the district, um, you know, the, some of the financial challenges around a leased facility is that the rent comes out of the operating dollars, not the capital dollars. Operating dollars are worth their weight in gold to a district um, because that's what you use to pay teachers and counselors and buy books and all that stuff. Capital dollars are separate. Um, and so for years, SLA's rent was the, ex was essentially the equivalent of about 12 teachers. Um, and in a distressed, uh, district in a financially distressed district, that's a problem. So the school reform commission several years ago, about four or five years ago now made the decision that they were ending all of the leases for buildings in Philadelphia, for schools in Philadelphia, and they were moving everything towards, um, buildings that the district already owned. We also had a challenge where many of our schools in Philadelphia are currently, the buildings are at a low utilization rate because there's not as many kids as there used to be due to the rise of charters and all these other things. There's you know many fewer thousands, there's literally tens of thousands fewer children in the school district of Philadelphia than there were even you know 15 years ago when SLA opened. Um, so uh, when the district, you know, sort of to solve the problem of where are we gonna put SLA, they looked at, um, the Ben Franklin High School campus on Broad and Spring Garden as a building that was underutilized. Ben Franklin 
um, had gone from over, you know, I, I think at its zenith, about 1,800 kids to at the time that this move was announced or the co-location was announced to about 500 kids. So they had a lot of extra capacity. Now the building itself hadn't been renovated ever pretty much. And it was built in the 1950s. Um, so it was in need of a lot of renovation for both campuses. So they saw it as an opportunity to renovate one building for two schools. Um, and it was in many respects, a good idea in theory and a very challenging one in reality because they also gave themselves a very aggressive timeline to get that work done. And we moved into a construction site, essentially. Um, you know, if you go back and you read all of the newspaper articles about it, we moved into a construction site. The Ben Franklin School uh, family moved, lived through a construction site, which was so not a good thing. Um, so we opened this year to, um, I would say about 70% of the building being ready uh, and ready might be in air quotes, but um, for example, John's uh, science labs weren't ready. Serenity's engineering lab wasn't ready. The cafeteria wasn't ready. The gym wasn't ready. Um, so we were jamming everybody into a much smaller space than really we uh, could fit into. And that was bad enough. And the construction dust was very, very serious. We had kids, including my own son, who was hospitalized due to exposure to construct construction dust and having um, respiratory issues due to that. And then after several weeks, weeks, just as we were starting to get to some kind of degree of what normal felt like um, in a still very challenging situation, they discovered that there was um, uh, active asbestos in multiple places that they thought that they had already abated. And so when that happened, it forced both schools to move out. Um, that was late September. So there were several weeks where both schools were kind of in limbo. We were operating in, we were sort of squatting uh, at 440 in the district headquarters um, in their first floor, kind of doing drop-in support, doing a lot of virtual SLA, um, but not having class and all the rest of that stuff. Ben Franklin wasn't even able to do that. We were able to do that because our kids were one to one laptop and we already had a digital platform. And so we were able to kind of cobble together something that resembled school, even if it was mostly online. Uh, and then by mid October, they decided that we would stay at 440. And uh, Ben Franklin, they rented a closed charter school um, way out on Broad Street near, near the edge of the city. Mm. Um, and that's where they were. Uh, both schools were in our, our temporarily, our permanent temporary homes uh, through President's Day weekend, at which point we moved back into the building with the building, which most of the work being done, although they're still actually, they're now doing a lot this summer to kind of finish the work, including um, fixing some of the stuff that needed to be done in the locker rooms, in the gym, in the bathroom, in the auditorium, but all of the academic spaces were done when we moved back in. Um, and we'd been in the building a whopping 19 days when the uh, uh, coronavirus shutdown happened. Um, so we spent a grand total of 38 days in the building, all school year, 19 in the front end, 19 in the back end. I would say the first 19 were um, as trauma inducing an environment in a school building as I've ever been in. Um, it was um, bad for kids, bad for adults. It was just bad and uh, it was unsafe. Like I said, my own son was hospitalized. Um, we, uh, our parents, our families were outraged as was I and we were actively working with the district to try to make that situation better. Um, and then they found the asbestos which ended up, you know, again, like sort of Mm -hmm. forcing the hand of the district to react and move us out. Uh, and then they leveraged that time to do a lot of the work in the building. I mean, and I think to the point that it really wasn't ready, it took until February mm -hmm. until we were able to resolve enough of the issues that we could really move in safely. Three more months, basically, at that point. Uh, October, November, four, really five, if you include September. So yeah, it was five months away from being um, habitable. I just have to say, it's crazy yeah. hearing it, even like living all of that, it's still pretty crazy to hear it out loud, laid out like that. The, the timeline just never sticks in my brain that way. But yeah, it was, yeah, it was crazy. I wanna remind people you're listening to COVID Calls and we are talking to Chris Lehman and John Henkel and Serenity 
Carozzini about what it's been like to be in school this year and talking about the class of 2020. John, let me just turn to you and ask you as we make this transition into, um, so we talked about everything leading up to uh, February, March, and then schools start closing because of COVID-19. What was that transition like for you and how has it been since then? Sure, going back to the day we closed, I'm pretty sure that Serenity was in the last class that I taught and it was a class that I was subbing for actually. Um, the teacher wasn't there that day, so I covered that class. So I was getting a lot of questions from seniors like when are we going back, what's going to happen next? And I just remember not knowing. That, that feeling of unsettled, of not knowing what's coming next, it was scary. And especially as a teacher, uh, not having answers for students is never a good feeling. Um, you get, as a teacher, you get comfortable saying, hey, I don't know, why don't you look it up? And having that inquiry-based experience, but to actually not know and not have the ability to point them and guide them in the right direction, uh, it, it, was, it was scary, it was not a good feeling. Um, transitioning to online learning, as Chris said, we had the experience earlier in the year. Uh, the one sticking point in that transition that has really stuck with me to this day is that I still don't think that you can have a one-to-one -one transition, meaning taking what you do in the classroom together and just throwing it online. And I think that's a huge misconception that a lot of teachers are going through right now and are trying to deal with. They're trying to do everything that they did collaboratively together physically in space in this virtual way. And I personally don't think that's the right way to look at it. Uh, the way that I've been looking at it is, as Chris said, to put students first, think about what is the best thing that we can do for them and what's the best thing we can provide for them. I, as a teacher at the college level myself, I think what you've just said is very eloquently put. Uh, the idea that you take what happens in one learning space and just translate it to the digital space, um, it doesn't seem to work that way. It doesn't mean that there are, there are advantages and disadvantages of both, but this idea that you just pick up one and move it into the other is, is not just a pedagogical challenge, but as you described, almost a psychological challenge for instructors as well, isn't it? Yeah, and um, I'm at Temple right now for getting my master's as well. And so I'm doing asynchronous learning myself as a student. And uh, Temple professors have been fantastic in terms of um, finding a way to make asynchronous learning work and learning a new way to teach or learning a new way to do anything is challenging for anyone who tackles it. So as teachers, it's really been about learning a completely new way to teach. So Serenity, from the student's perspective, first of all, tell us a little bit about what it was like that first week or so when you're realizing schools closing down. What did you think? And then what's that transition been like to be a, a student at home? Um, I kind of thought it was a little bit of a sick joke that <laughs> we any time in the school to begin with. And I remember going back to school after what we've been calling the asbestos break. Um, and then this kind of like buildup of the corona break. It felt like I have some friends at private schools and friends in other parts of the countries. And at least from the people I know, we were like one of the last places to close. Um, all year I've been planning, uh, SLA does a senior project for all the seniors called a capstone. And it's supposed to be an 80 plus hour project that you do, um, you choose it based on either your interest or your field of study. And it's supposed to just show, kind of be the climax of your entire high school, high school experience and what you've taken away from that. And I've been planning mine since sophomore year. I had a mission and I knew in general what I wanted to make. And- Well, you I, have to tell us what it is. I mean, we have to hear about that. <laughs> The, the original idea is that I wanted to build a record player from scratch and 3D and laser cut some uh, records. And eventually, uh, by the time I got to my senior year, I wanted to make a, build my own record player, but also a soft hack, a 1998 Furby toy. So it would interact with the record player and they were electronically intertwined and it was this big complicated project that I was stubborn about working. So in 
in the weeks coming up to when we closed, um, I had already lost so much time that I needed. I needed a shop in order to machine and prototype and everything that I had already planned out just got so much time taken off. So I already knew that my project would be a lot more lacking than I had planned. And I tried to cope with that and I tried to kind of move things around and not having access to the shop itself until February with those final 19 days, it was no time for me. Uh, I'm gonna sound like a bad student saying this, but in the time that we spent at school in between the asbestos and Corona break, I did not go to many of my classes. I spent so much time in the shop and just focusing on this project and collecting my materials because I knew that anything that I needed to machine or build or you know use a 3D printer for or laser cut, it needed to happen fast because we, we were living day to day not knowing when our school was gonna close for quarantine. Um, even on the last day, like Mr. Henkel was my last class of the day. I remember I was sitting there so smugly. I had my feet up on the desk and I was like, Mr. Henkel, can I go grab my stuff off the 3D printer and pack up my stuff to get ready to go? Because I just knew that would be the last day. And we had we heard the announcement while we were in that class. And I, it was this big feeling of relief that I had prepared so much for leaving. But um, after the fact, after I was, because everything was moving so fast, once I was home and working on this project, it, that's when senior year hit me. Like, wow, I shouldn't have had to do it this way. And I missed like all of my major, everything that someone would want out of his senior year never happened for me. And I don't get to redo that. <laughs> You're describing uh, a commitment to doing something awesome. I don't think I had when I was 18. I don't have a memory of building anything uh, of any use to anyone in, in my senior year of high school. I do remember being absolutely 100% committed to my time with my friends. <laughs> and, I, and I wonder how that's been for you, how you keep your social network going. You have tools these days we didn't have in, in those days back in the 20th century, but still, um, what's that been uh, like? Um, I'm, I'm an introvert. It, you wouldn't know that about me seeing me at school just because I'm somebody who went put in, you know, just a school or academic environment. I usually like want to lead a group or, you know, interact with people, but with the option to be alone and introverted, I definitely choose that. Be we didn't have much time at school. I didn't have a lot of a social outlet this year. And I you know the time that I was at school, I was so focused on working that I didn't have a lot of time to spend with my friends. And I found um, that during this time, everyone's just been focusing on, there's like, this is a controversial thing to say people are arguing whether or not like to hold people responsible uh socially as much as we usually do but you definitely see who's prioritizing themselves versus who's prioritizing their loved ones or you know people close to them and it's it's hard knowing that i'm about to go to college and i never got to say goodbye to any of these people i didn't really get to spend time there was no closure and the majority of people at my school now, I'm never gonna see them again and they haven't reached out or I haven't reached out to them. So um, it that, that stings and kind of makes me not want to talk to people because it's just too sad. Chris from the principal's office, what's, what's it been like on your side to try to cope with the kinds of things that Serenity is describing here? And I appreciate you, Serenity, sharing those, those insights. It's really important for people to hear those, those things. What's it been like on your side, Chris, to manage those kind of expectations? Yeah, I think it's crippling. I mean, I think it is, I mean, you know, I mean, I, you know, I don't think there's any, you know, uh, I mean, this has just been a lousy year. I mean, simply, and there's no other way. <laughs> And um, this isn't the experience we wanted for our seniors. Um, I had, you know, in addition to being um, 
a principal, as you know, as John alluded to earlier, I'm also our boys' ultimate frisbee coach. I had ten seniors on the team this year. This past weekend should have been states. Uh, we've been looking. We circled it on our calendar back in September. Um, those are boys that, like, you know, for four years I have worked with that group, and we were looking forward to that. Um, you know, and I, I think there isn't, you know, there isn't. Uh, there's not a way to authentically recreate that, right? There's not a way like, you know, we send emails when I've emailed with at this point, well over, you know, half of the senior class for one reason or another. Um, you know, I send out bulk emails to the community, multiple, you know, all the time and say like, here's what we're thinking. We've tried to do activities for families that they can take part in. We've done Instagram things we've got a video in the works for the kids and all this stuff and none of that is the same right none of that is the same all of that is um there is an aspect of performative to it sure. that is not the same as the authentic relationships that happen when you're there right like um and you know and you do the best you can right so like for the group of kids we've got a group of seniors who we're still working hard with them to get them over the finish line to you know finish some of their work and i've got a group that i text every single day i'm like how's this going how's this going how's this going and they can tell you and they will tell you that they appreciate that and they know that that is an, that is that is a manifestation of care but it's not the same thing as me putting my arm around them and dragging them into my office and making them do the work in front of me right like it's yeah. just not the same um, you know, and, you know, we're going to try to do, a, we're going to try to do something meaningful for graduation, you know, with a virtual graduation ceremony, and it's not the same. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things to that end is, you know, one of the things that is sort of driving me crazy in the national scene right now, when people are like, this is a reason we can reinvent school and you know, this and that. And I'm like, you know what, like, no, we, right, exactly <laughs> to that end. Right, that is the right response to that. And that is because when school is done well and right, and I fully understand that in a lot of places it's not, but when school is done well and right, it is a profound place and it is a sacred place. And, you know, for me, it's, I have at least temporarily lost my sacred space and lost the place that I, I consider holy. Um, and for me to not have that and for me to not, be able to, I mean, just something as dumb, it hit me the other day with an email that I had, you know, with the email I had to send out yesterday to the families updating them on when the yearbook is coming in, is uh, the day the yearbooks come in is this amazing day at SLA where we just all sit around and sign each other's yearbooks. And I know that lots of schools do that and everybody does that and like, yay, but it, it, it is, it's very real, right? And like, you see like kids, not just wanting their friends to sign it, but wanting their teachers and their advisors to sign it and wanting, sure. Like it's this real thing yeah. and to not have that moment, right? Where like I get to spend a minute, you know, I get to spend a minute or two thinking about every single senior and writing something meaningful for them. Um, you know, yeah. and that hurts. Uh, it's not good, right? Like I, um, as much as I look forward to going to the virtual capstone presentation that Serenity is going to make in a week, um, it's not the same as being in the room. Um, you know, it's one of those things like, like, you know, we used to say, you know, if, if the old model of school was that people went to school because that's where the knowledge, that's where the learning was, right? That's where the expert was, right? Back in the day before the internet, the experts were at school. So you went to school because that's where they were. Well, now what we've tried to build with SLA is with the notion of the sort of ubiquity of, of information, school is where we make sense of the world together right? School is where we are together. And that matters, right? When you can build true communities that are caring and, and, and that are about care and learning, you build profound places. And to then not have that, when I think for so many of us, students, teachers, admin, what have you, it becomes a meaningful space for us in real ways. And to not have all of the ritual that goes with leaving that space, um, it's, really, it's really hard. Uh, it's nothing I want for any of these kids. It's nothing I want for my own son, who's a sophomore, who's missing, you know, who's had a really mediocre sophomore year at SLA. <laughs>
I want to remind um, people you're listening to COVID Calls, and we are talking to Chris Lehman and Serenity Baroncini and John Henkel about the experience of COVID-19 and high school. And uh, John, I think you wanted to come in on that on that last point of what Chris was talking about there, about yeah. missing, what's missing from the sacred space when we're not there. What's it like? Yeah, and Chris, I'm actually going to quote you. I'm surprised you didn't say this. Uh, for students, especially seniors, this is 25% of their high school experience that they're missing out on. For a teacher, from the teacher perspective, if we have a good career and we stick with this, this is one out of 30 years. This is, this is a drop in a pond for us. But for high school seniors, this is a huge chunk of what they're missing. So when I hear Serenity talk about everything that she's missed in her senior year, it hurts. It, it puts me as a teacher back in the student's position and it, it hurts a lot. And I think we're gonna see repercussions of this for a very long time for this uh, senior class. Well, for all students that are in school right now. Um, if I can add to that, just- I hope, yeah, thank you, I hope you will. Uh, my, I keep bringing up robotics, but that, that's, <laughs> that was my life during high school. Um, being able to grow in the shop, like I'm a totally different person than I was when I was 14, and I'm sure everyone is, but um, I, went from being more of a student in the sense and on the team um, to being more of a mentor and a leader on the team as I was an upperclassman uh, last year, last season was our best season ever as a team. It's the first time we've ever won an award or a competition. It was miraculous high point of my life so far, hands down. Um, and that comes from you know, we have created this environment, especially around STEM, where it's open to everyone. A lot of first or box competition teams have a minimum GPA requirement, or you have your, you and your parents have to pay five grand a year for your kid to be on the team. And what that does is it creates that when you go to these competitions, you see middle or upper class white males on these giant suburban teams with nice shirts and like uh, flags in the bleachers and all this really nice equipment, powder coated robots. And, you know, we've never been like that. We, we show up in just our team shirts, no gazebo, no nothing. Um, and we come with what, what we made. And it's always kind of been like, let's have a good time and let's work together and you know show we're one of the only philly teams so we had to represent philly and that came with like grit and a little bit of grease you know um and i was so excited this year to be the team captain and drive coach at competitions i started as the driver at competitions my freshman year drove for three years and this year i was supposed to coach and that was like probably going to be the highlight of my senior year was that I came full circle into coming into something I had no idea I was capable of doing and then being able to teach someone else how to do that. This year we had one of our highest freshman retention rates and you know Mr. Camel who started the club or ran the club for a good amount of time you know even told me that as from the experience that I had, I created this kind of tone of the room that everybody felt welcome in. And that was, that was my thing. And I worry a lot, for especially for the kids who this was their first year on the team. Like, what do they think? Like, did they, like, what was their impression of what it's supposed to be like on this team? Like, there were so many outside forces pushing on making this not work that I didn't really get the chance to do what I that my entire high school career was building up to and I lost my chance to make the impact that I wanted to it feels like and that that sucks I really hope that next if we're back or they're back in the building next year um you know who's who's the captain of the team how are they going to run the team or are we going to be in the building? There's no way that we can replicate that that room, those late nights, those competitions from behind a computer screen 
And because of that, there's going to be so many kids whose lives could have been changed like mine was that are going to miss out on that. This is, for me, a very profound conversation because, you know, rightfully, we are all focused around the world right now on people who are sick and people who have died. And that's important and that that has to be the focus. But at the same time, you're all describing in each of your individual ways what it's like also to miss out on a moment. And, and I think John, I'm a little older than you. So the idea of missing one thirtieth of my teaching career, actually that sounds like a lot to me. Like I, that feels like a loss to me, like a meaningful percentage. Um, and I'm not sure we're at that point yet as a country. I'd like to see what the three of you think about this, that um, where we're talking much about these missed moments or these missed opportunities yet. Again, because so much has been driven by necessarily the conversation around health, but it will not be the only Im impact. If we look at the coronavirus as a, a much broader swath that it cuts through American society, I think this conversation you're having right now is illuminating um, it's one of many conversations we're going to have to have to let people say things like what two of the three of you have said, like, hey, this sucks. This is not good. <laughs> this is not yeah. what I wanted to be doing. I don't, I don't know. I think we have to really chant, have more of these conversations to allow people to say these things and be honest about how they're feeling. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, when this all started, I wrote a piece for educators basically saying, don't think about what's good, right? Think about what's least bad. Right, because this isn't going to be good. This is your 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 high water mark is least bad, right? And you know, yes, there will be good moments. Yes, there will be things we learn. Yes, I mean, I was just on a call earlier today talking about next year and how we're going to have to move so much of our internship program to virtual internships and have remote internships. And yes, there will be some opportunities there that we would not have had because we've you know traditionally worked in the where kids can get to spaces. So yes, there will be some serendipity. Yes, there will be some things we learn that will inform some different ways of doing things moving forward. But um, the profound um, sense that we should have of this time is one of loss. And I think mm -hmm. that acknowledging that and owning that um, allows us a path through it, actually. And I think all of these folks were like, this is, you know, like, you know, the sort of, um, crisis profiteers, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. those folks, um, you know, aren't, aren't the folks who are going to authentically come out the other side, having made a real difference in people's lives and, and owning that. And I think that um, the folks who do will be the folks who can live and live in and acknowledge the very real hurt of this time and the very real loss of this time and start from, um, start any conversation about what comes next with how do we first take care of one another? John, can I get uh, your thoughts on this? Sure, um, two things. The, the first piece that you said about time and having these conversations throughout the time, I think as we move further away from uh, the peak of this pandemic, I think that these conversations um, are going to be more and more valuable because perspective changes everything. Um, Serenity said it that while she was in school feeling accomplished because she knew something bad was going to happen next and getting it all done, there was a sense of accomplishment. And it wasn't until later that she looked back and said, wow, that's not how I want to spend my senior year. Um, and the other piece to these conversations that are going to change over time is that the human need to feel uh, like we need to justify or compare to other things. And I've done it a bunch in this conversation where we almost need to, in order to talk about our own grief or our own loss, we need to compare it and say, but it's not as bad as this. And I think that there really needs to be a space for students especially to say, what I'm going through is bad and not needing to compare it to anyone else's bad, just to say, hey, th this is bad for me and I need, I need to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, I think my, my generation, uh, or at least my class even, there's been quite the divide of students 
uh, but you see a also. lot of conflict between, you know, my peers on social media, especially there's the students who are like, we want our caps and gowns, we were robbed, you know, but, 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 like our school senior year has been awful, feeling personally attacked, we want a graduation. And then there's the other side of people who are just like, you know, don't focus on yourself right now. People are dying, calm down. Like you not having a graduation is not the same as dying. And um, I think like what Mr. Henkel was saying is valuable in that there needs to be a middle ground here where we can recognize each other's pain and struggles and what is happening in the world around us while we stay home, while also recognizing that what we're going through here is not normal and isn't supposed to feel good. Um, and it, it's, it's really hard to, you know, talk to people about these things because everyone is so sternly on one side or the other and just, you know, that I, I know people who haven't social distanced at all and their parents haven't been enforcing it. They're still going out because, well, it's not me who's dying and I'm not going to let coronavirus take away my, you know, high school experience. And that's, that's, that's just as sad as the friends I have who have not said a word to anybody who haven't left their room, let alone their house, you know, mm -hmm. um, and the, the, this conversation also like what Mr. Henkel was saying is going to look different as we move forward because everything's changing, but I, I just, I don't know how many people it's actually helping because there are so many people not willing to have the conversation yet. Well, we're up on time. I would like to give Serenity, if you don't mind, I really was moved by the last, by everything you've said, the last thing you said, but maybe give you the last word um, from Philadelphia, from high school seniors in Philadelphia to other seniors across the country. What do you want to say? You take this time to, uh, I've, at least I've taken this time to reconnect with people in my life who I thought I'd already lost just because of the passing of time take this time to be really kind to yourself and kind to the people that you care about because we definitely have the time right now and um i don't think that things are going to go back to normal or necessarily get easier just things are going to be different in the future and to take every opportunity you can to make the best out of it because um time is precious and i don't want to waste you know, I don't want to say that my senior year felt like a waste because there was stuff I missed out on, but I also know I did my best and I don't want to look back on what I'm doing now in a year and think that it was a waste of time. So tomorrow at five o'clock every day, every weekday at five o'clock, we have COVID calls and tomorrow we'll continue this conversation about the class of 2020 with two graduating college seniors and one uh, high school senior from Dallas. And I want to thank Chris Lehman and Serenity Barazzini and John Henkel for making time for this conversation today. It's been a really wonderful conversation. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Stay healthy, everyone. You too. You too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.